Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. As you may have spotted in the intro, I'm delighted to say that the Damcasters is now brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona. I've just come back from visiting Pima, and I can say that it lives up to its billing as one of the most exciting museums in the world. Now, I'm not just saying that because, you know, they're sponsoring the show, but I've been able to see the collection and spend time with the team there and get to understand how the place works. And the passion that goes into keeping that place running is amazing. Over the coming months, we will have interviews with some of the people connected to the museum, either through their role there or through items in the collection that they have a personal connection with. But this week, we're going to start with a chat with the executive director of the Arizona Aerospace Foundation, Scott Marchand. The Arizona Aerospace Foundation encompasses the Pima Air and Space Museum, the Titan Missile Museum, the Arizona Aviation Hall of Fame, and coming hopefully in 2024, the Tucson Military Vehicle Museum, which will house the foundation's extensive vehicle collection. I sat down with Scott at his home last week and over drinks we discussed many things. And as we chatted, we moved closer to and further away from the microphone. So if we get quiet, that are bad. I'm sorry about that. I've tried to fix it as best I can. But there we go. We started our chat by quickly talking about the vehicle museum. And really, how would a vehicle museum fit in to the wider aerospace setting there in Tucson? Well, sure it does. I mean, it's it feels like a bit of a mission stretch. But in reality, if you think about kind of the history of aviation evolution, I mean, certainly militarily and then indirectly, commercially and civilly, you know, a lot of those airframes were all developed to support, you know, the mission and role of the soldier on the ground. And it's a remarkable collection. I was fortunate to head around with Andrew Hedder Collections today, and we barely covered a lot of it in two hours of walking around. And you were mm -hmm. saying earlier that in your time there, you've added 200 aircraft to yep. the collection. Yep. Now, this conversation is really going to be looking at the American side of the museum business. Sure. Um, and in, in your specific case, being yeah. an independent museum, yeah. for want of a better expression. Yeah. So what goes into building a collection like that? And when we say adding 200 aircraft, that's over 20 years of, sure. of your time there. So it's not... <laughs> it's not an overnight. Yeah, it's not, yeah, not the yeah. most showing up last yeah. week. Yeah. So what goes into the running of a museum when you're looking at a staying relevant and b attracting punters through the door because that's yeah. what keeps things going sure yeah well <clears throat> yeah well, there's a lot to unpack there in a in a in a simple I'm, question, I'm, you've made right? me drink i'm gonna sit <laughs> back and listen <laughs> well cheers yeah um right well we should probably start at the beginning yes right? so um you know, where we're the, the P. Marin Space Museum is, is a pretty unique um, facility and organization. I mean, you know, certainly no two air and space museums are quite the same. I mean, there's a lot of commonality, a lot of similarity, and sort of, you know, the mission, the audience, um, the type of collections that we develop or seek to develop. Um, but a lot of it really is um, location, 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 right? Um, <clears throat> in our case, um, many of your listeners are probably familiar with, with, you know, the mythic boneyards out in Tucson, Arizona and, and the desert aircraft storage facilities. And, you know, we are, we are directly a consequence of that, um, industry and, uh, government program. So in the way, way back, uh, shortly after World War II, um, you know, the U S military had a huge quantity of, of excess airframes, uh, from, from the war. And many of them were virtually brand new or in very good condition. Um, there was some feeling that there'd be future utility for certain types of airframes. Um, many of them were obsolete, worn out, or, you know, in the interest of consolidating budgets and focusing on the development of the next generation of jet aircraft. Um, the, you know, the World War II type of aircraft was winnowed down to a very narrow group of aircraft that were slated for preservation. Largely, they were things like the B-29s, the transportation, <clears throat> like C-47s, um, 
things like the B-25, which became very, very useful as a utility aircraft, and Corsairs, um, things like that. But, you know, most everything else that was used widely in World War II was, was rapidly disposed of, either sold or relegated to some reserve units. And largely those aircraft were disposed of at large scrapping, designated scrapping locations like Kingman, Arizona, up north of here. Uh, Chino, California, uh, Tullahoma, Oklahoma, and several other sites scattered around the country, as well as overseas. I mean, a lot of airframes, I mean, almost the entire Marauder fleet was uh, scrapped in Germany at the end of the yeah. war. <clears throat> um, so, in casting around to look for a location to store these aircraft, um, the Air Force settled on Tucson for a variety of reasons, um, in no particular order, um, it was out of the way at the time, uh, was relatively lightly populated. There were good facilities here. Uh, Davis Mountain Air Force Base had been a formation facility for B-24 units as well as other types of training commands. Uh, so it had a good long runway. There was lots of room to expand, um, very sympathetic community, but it was, you know, it was the pre-interstate era. So it was, it was, it was really out of the way. So if you're trying to have a, a secure military facility that was accessible, but not, too accessible. Yeah, not too accessible and, and not disrupting, you know, the ebb and flow of a larger population center. Like, you know, it wouldn't have been very practical to do it in the San Fernando Valley or some of these type of places. So the other things going forward is, of course, we have a lovely climate here. It can get warm in the, in the summer, but, you know, that's not really detrimental to aircraft to the degree the moisture is, right? So, um we have mild winters. We have low relative humidity. I mean, for most of the year, aside of a few rainy points in the year, we're looking at 10% humidity, relatively speaking. Um, and the weather aside of that is, is fairly benign too. So we don't, we don't get really big, you know, we don't, we're not subject to things like hurricanes, cyclones. We're outside of tornado alley. Um, geologically it's a stable region. There aren't earthquakes to speak of. There's no volcanic activity. Um, we do get, you know, very intense thunderstorms in the summer, but you know, they tend to be localized and, you know, while we've certainly had some, hair raising episodes with <laughs> with some of the thunderstorms you know they're you know they're rare and, and and from a military standpoint a government standpoint that's an acceptable risk right i mean you know when you've got say 5000 aircraft stored in the desert um if a microburst damages a couple of them yeah who yeah. cares right um we at the museum take a different view of that type of risk but <laughs> um uh, but really the the biggest the biggest factor for locating uh the facility here, which was initially called MASDIC, which was Military Aerospace Disposition Center. That's was one of the most military names I think they could have come up with. Yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it? And it was MASDIC for a very long time, like even, even into the 1980s when it became, uh, uh, when it first became a mark, you know, the Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Center, and then later downgraded to group status. But the, the big kicker that settled Tucson as a favorable location um, was proximity to the railroads and the ground conditions. So the soil in this area is very, very, it's heavily calcified and it's heavily, it's, it's got a high clay concentration. Uh, it's sort of a, it's a chemical composition known, you know, sort of as caliche. So it, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a high level of calcium carbonate. So, so the Tucson Valley here at one point in the district geologic past was a was a lake bed and as it dried up over the year the you know the mineral contents leached out and the soil it did become alkaline i mean things obviously grow here it's not like the salt lake city basin where it's basically a sterile yeah. you know or uh, for the salt and sea area and places like that um so what the cleachy is it's a band of deposited calcium and the calcium carbonate in the clay has blended in the soil so what that means is when it dries and hardens up, it is literally like concrete, right? So if you're a gardener around here and you're trying to plant a tree or something, you need a pickaxe or a jackhammer, right? Or you wait until it rains or you soak the soil. So why does that matter when you're parking airplanes? Well, there's a lot of advantages, right? So if you were to try and do this in other more commonly experienced geologic conditions, you would have to do an awful lot of paving or concrete pouring. And the facility out here, um, 
it's huge, right? So it's it's several hundred square miles of territory. So you can imagine every airplane in existence has a different tie-down pattern, right? Uh, it's got tie-down hooks at different points of the fuselage, the wings, the, the nose, and you tie them out in a certain geometry. So if, if you can imagine the rate aircraft are entering and leaving service, and if you're trying to store them, well, how do you create an engineered apron that can accommodate all of the existing tie-down requirements and unforeseen future tie-down requirements, right? So the beauty out here is when the, when the soil is hard, you know, it, it is literally like concrete. You can tow the airplanes anywhere you want. And what they devised was a system of basically simple ground anchors, like giant tent poles, right? With a, you know, it's about a three foot long ground anchor with an eye hook on one end and a screw head. And you just drive it into the ground with a post holder, wherever you want to put it, lay out your pattern, tie down your airplane. When you need to change your parking pattern, you just pull it out of the ground, put it where you want it. Presto. So it makes it very, very pragmatic, right? Um, so from 1948 through the 1950s and into the early 60s, there was an awful lot of activity here. I mean, you know, for listeners that are familiar with aviation history, you know, that was sort of um, a wild era for aircraft design and innovation. It would come out of the war. Jets were here to stay. It was... Um, the wave of the future, but early jet engines weren't always the best. Early aircraft that used some of the early jets weren't always the best. So things were cycling through it was also great from a, you know an economic recovery standpoint. I mean, if you had an airplane company and a vision, you could you stood a pretty good chance of selling a contract to the yes. government, right? Um, you know, um, so you had a there was actually a very rapid cycle of of, of early aircraft. Um, that were designed, procured, say 1949, 1950, that by 1955 were fully retired. Things like, uh, you know, the straight wing F-84s yep. or um, <clears throat> shit early, you know, some of the early like B-45 tornadoes and things like that. Um, you know, there were certainly some amazing aircraft that were unbeatable, you know, like the B-47 and, you know, the B-52 sort of started coming off in, I think, 1952, and they're still with us and will be for decades yet. So, and you've also got the interim big stuff like the, the B-36, which yeah hangs around for a while, but is not really... No. no let, it, was, it was a garbage airplane. You know? I, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting out to go look at it, but... <laughs> well, it's a stunning thing. I mean, you know, the... Yeah, the B-36 was one of these things that, you know, it, it stayed in service because it was around and available after the point of its necessity, mm -hmm. right? So it was initially conceived of in 1942 um, to be an intercontinental bomber. Like, it was really, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a fallback system uh, that the Americans were working on in case Britain got knocked out of the war. They'd be able to you know, base B-36s in Newfoundland mm. or, or Reykjavik and uh, um, carry on the bombing campaign over Germany with, you know, this this, this airplane that could carry 40,000 pounds of bombs for 22 hours. Um, well, that never happened. Um, the development process with, with the B-36 was far more complicated than anybody in the government or Convair wow. Imagined at the time, so you know the B thirty six is really which, which, which is nuts when you think of an aircraft that's that big. Yeah, like six six engines. Yeah, six six pushers. Yep, and you think well, of course that's going to run into some problems because oh, it's with cooling. You have to you know engineer your propellers to run the opposite direction, and you have you know all the fuel has to be on board plus your payload. You know you typically needed to provide for a relief crew. You know all sorts of things that have you know sort of become common practice later on, but were really innovative at the time um, with materials and technologies that were still. I mean these are things that were being sort of developed as they were headed towards production, right? Um, the forty three sixty engine, which is oh god, it's a massive radio. Like it's basically. What is it? Forty-eight cylinders. You know, yep. It's a forty-eight cylinder sort of corn cob radiating um, uh, conventional engine um, that was then developed to push the propeller. You know, rather than tractor air over the engine. So of course you had cooling issues. So you had to have cooling ducts, and and but you needed aerodynamics in the nacelle, and then aluminum was a strategic material. So that you know any non-essential 
structural or skin area of the B36, uh, magnesium was substituted, right? So, you know, it um, they got the nickname magnesium overcast at one point. <clears throat> um, so they came into service in 1948. Um, there were 384 of them built, and the last one was retired in 1958, which is the one we have in our collection. And it basically flew out of the factory into, you know, some maybe two years with the Air Force before retiring completely in 1962 in Dallas-Fort Worth. So, you know, there's there's actually pictures that we have in our collection of fields of B, B-36s being scrapped out at, at Mazdaq in the 50s. And, um, you know, it was a fairly... It was a fairly brutal practice, you know. They they would literally tractor engines or you know aircraft into piles, uh, pull the engines off, and they had mobile smelters that they pulled up to where they were crunching up the airplanes and just basically fed the raw materials into the ovens, pulled ingots out the other side and pitched the slag over the door and hauled the metal out. So over the course of these scrapping op, you know operations in, in the 1950s, um, you know being out in the wild west and, and relatively unsupervised. Uh, you know, the commanders and the senior officers out there, a lot of them who had had World War II service and some of them going back to the First World War, um, you know, recognized these were sort of important technological and historic times. So they started plucking, you know, one or two representative aircraft out of the, 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 the fleets that were being scrapped. And they started parking them along uh, Gulf Links Road um, on the northern perimeter of the base. And this, you know, quickly became known as Celebrity Row. And... Um, by 1962, there were about 48 unique individual aircraft parked along there. And um, an inspector general's team from the Pentagon came out and were wandering around the base checking on operations and making suggestions for improvements. And they spotted this row of airplanes and were, you know, I'm, I'm imagining the past and paraphrasing conversations I'm sure went on at longer, greater, more, you know, <laughs> diplomatic detail, but really like, Gentlemen, what are you doing with all these airplanes that are supposed to have been destroyed? And like, well, you know, they're historic, they're sentimental, they're important, they're pretty, they're all these things. They're like, okay, well, basically, gentlemen, you've had your fun, time to dispose of them and, and move on with your, you know, your your due duty. And fortunately, you know, the one Mazda commander at the time, you know, Colonel Perkins, um, you know, he decided he wasn't going to take that. So, he, you know, he, he, he decided he wanted to, to fight for these aircraft. Not, not, not fight in a really tough way, but, you know, he make, felt... Make, make the case. Yeah, he made yeah. the case for them, right? So, um, you know, he was social in the region, and, you know, the president of the Bank of Tucson at the time was a fellow named uh, Anthony Grosetta, and he had been the commanding officer of the 406 Fighter Group in World War II, a, a Thunderbolt unit, and, you know, he was involved in military affairs committee around mm -hmm. here, and, you know, the, the local county government was always had an eye towards developing tourism and, and things of nature. I mean, there'd been movie industry here and, you know, Westerns and all that kind of stuff. And there, you know, it was a little bit of a Palm Springs getaway for celebrities. So, I mean, you know, Tucson was out of the way, but not a, you know, not a backwater, right? So they got the politicians involved and, and congressmen. And so they proposed a pitch to the Air Force. They said, look, if we can get these out of your way, you know, the communities decided we would support the, the formation of a, you know, an air museum foundation that would take these in under a wing and present them for, for public view and preservation and, and go from there. And the Air Force said, okay, fine, you got a deal. That's, that's not a problem. And the thing to remember, too, in this area in the early 60s, I mean, air museums as a thing globally really didn't exist in the way that we recognize them now. Um, you know, certainly museums have been established for a very, very long time in different ways, but they tend to mirror cultural history or art or historical society. Nobody had really undertaken the enterprise of preserving large industrial objects. I mean, you know, there's there's some you know, there are some preserved ships in the UK, like, you know, the Unicorn up in, in, in Dundee and mud stuff. But, you know, this this mass preservation of, of large outdoor objects really hadn't been pondered or taken on. Um, you know, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum certainly existed as a, as, as a branch of, of SI, and they had representative aircraft there. I mean, sort of the Wright Flyer and other things, but they had storage issues. Um, the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force, had been collecting kind of a nascent heritage collection, you know, drawn from some historic airframes and remnants of the capture collections that were evaluated at Freeman Field. 
and you know some of these were allocated to the Smithsonian, some were allocated to the to the U.S. Air Force. But you know, there seems like the XB-19 was stored here in 1948, and and you know, in the 50s, it's like, well, what are we going to do with this thing? There's nowhere for it to go. We can't fly it. Like, ah. So you know, they they got crunched up, right? Um, and we we have to remember as well that it's. It's straight necessity, isn't it? It's, oh. this, this thing is no longer of use. There yeah. isn't already a foundation for these things to go to. And by foundation, yeah. I mean a, a museum. A mechanism for yeah. these things. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's not the, we talked about this in the car, yeah. there, there wasn't this hand-wringing of, oh, we must save these things. It no. Was, they're no, no longer of use to us. So. Yeah. No, there wasn't really a lot of sentimentality in a lot of the stuff in, in, in that era as a wide cultural phenomenon. I mean, obviously there were, you know, People who were aviation nuts certainly before the war as a consequence of the First World War. There continued to be after the war. There was a lot of people who came back with pilot training who bought themselves an air coupe or a Cessna mm -hmm. 120 and continued to fly. But, you know, the relative interest in big, expensive, complicated military machines wasn't really there. Um, you know, those are sort of a sidebar. So like, you know, the early warbird movement in North America sort of started getting its, its, its embryonic genesis at that time with guys like Ed Maloney out in Chino yeah. and, and Dave Talashe who, you know, uh, had that military service and were just nuts about these things and saw a business and a historic opportunity to, to save these things. Well, really nobody else wanted to. I mean, uh, you know, the, you know, Ed Maloney bought a Messerschmitt 262 from the surplus administration at Cheeto with, with no competitive bidders, right? You know, so maybe I think probably a couple hundred dollars at the time, right? Um, so we, um, yeah, so, you know, so there wasn't really a depository for these yeah. things, right? Um, you know, the Air Force Museum as such as... Uh an entity with a physical address and a structure to preserve and interpret these aircraft didn't really form until about 1968. They didn't really get ground and buildings and, and you know, underneath them. I mean, they had the big move. And this was about 1971, 72, when they really opened in the venue they are now. The Smithsonian had, you know, conceived of the National Air and Space Museum on the mall about that time. And we're starting construction with an eye towards opening in 1976. Uh, Pensacola was getting sort of established as a heritage site. And so we were developing at the same time all these national collections. And we were one of the few large private entities that were formulating with a specific heritage preservation mission, right? So it made good sense. We've always had a challenge raising money and, and getting the support we needed. So the Air, the Air Museum Foundation of Pima County chartered in 1966. Um, we secured 136 acres through the BLM, through GSA, with a perpetual land use grant. So we paid $2 an acre for the land back in 1966. Now what? Well, we have 48 airplanes assigned to us, a pile of dirt in the desert, uh, with no roads anywhere near it, um, a fence sharing with the base. Well, they had to collect money, they had to build fences, they had to clear land, they had to come up with some sort of operational plan to attract people here to see it. Um, you know, I, I, I guarantee you that, you know, the people conceiving of this back in, oh, say, 1970 could never have imagined in their wildest dreams what we would become. I think they, I think they had hoped for this type of development because um, you know reading the early documentation it was clear from the founding days this was never intended to be strictly a military museum the the the, the mission was always to broadly represent the diverse achievement of aerospace right so civil commercial experimental foreign domestic failed successful celebrated despised you know if it flies it fits right yeah um, of course, that's easier said than done. When these things have high value and you have no money, guess what you don't get? <laughs> you, know, you you get charity. And, and in our in our case, we were very fortunate to have the charity of the U.S. Air Force and, and the Army and the Navy and, and, and organizations like that who, you know, really was, it was a much easier time because there wasn't really anybody else doing this. So there was, you know, you read back some of the early documentation, it's like, Oh, hey, you know, Colonel so-and-so has a BT-6 up on the, you know, this facility. If you guys can get a truck up there, you know, you can take it. You know, there were, there were tech schools had old stuff. There were guys who had projects that bought from surplus that defeated them, and they decided, oh, I'm not going to be able to finish this. So, you know, they got donated to get them out of the way. And 
you know, as they were trying to scrape the ground and put fences up, they were, you know, they were acquiring airplanes, they were acquiring parts. And, um, but by 1975, there was real concern that, you know, we just weren't going to make it. And, you know, the, the first sort of executive director slash board president and really, you know, the energy, like the guy who really carried the ball, brought the baby out of the womb and, and brought into the world was a guy named Rhodes Arnold, who had been a World War II uh, transport pilot in the Pacific. He was a um, New Mexico Air Guard officer, and he retired, came to Tucson, was a high school teacher here. And he really took it upon himself to to make this his mission, and he horsewhipped, cajoled, um, just through sheer force of will, made us happen. And he he decided that if we didn't get our asses open by the bicentennial, when everybody in America was getting really excited about our history, the 200th anniversary, and all the celebrations, our goose was cooked. So um, he did it. May 8th, 1976, we opened for business for the first day to modest fanfare with an Airstream trailer, some barbed wire fences, and a dirt track down to uh, what eventually became the I-10. And um, there we go. So uh, so since then, they had steadily struggled to raise money. They, you know, they, they scratched together enough money to build our first building in 1981, uh, which is our main entrance facility, and is still sort of absorbed into the complex we have now. One thing that really helped us, and i got to give props and kudos at Fly Pass Magazine, I mean, we were featured in their very first issue in 1982. It was like this this gem in the desert and a place you got to see. And, and uh, um, they've been great proponents of ours, and we, we've got a, a terrific fan base in the UK and in Europe and, and, and now globally. You know, we get a lot of people from Oceania, um, you know, until COVID and some of the geopolitical challenges, we had a lot of an increase in travel from China and the Far East. And um, from there, it was just a steady, you know, steady push towards every four or five years, they scratched together enough money that they squeezed out of operations to put a down payment on a building and, you know, raise 10% from donations and put a few more airplanes inside and showcase a few more and build the collection by any means available. And it's steadily grown to the point now where you drive in and I you know, jokingly said I was like the, the dog at the window. Mm -hmm. which one I was, it's quite a sight. And then you see mm -hmm. the size of the hangars. The drive that was there, and I mm -hmm. guess this, that's one of the things I want to talk to you about, is for, for a museum to be able to continue to, I don't want to say expand in the way of just get bigger, but to continue to express what the yeah. collection is. Yeah need someone that is willing to do the hard yards, do the cajoling, doing the, the glad yeah. handing, yeah. which is you. Hmm. So really when you're doing the day job and you're looking at, you know, with, with your team, with your collections team, with the preservation team, all of that, what is, I don't want to say what keeps you going, um, but what is the, the modus operandi you have to go in to push the museum forward so that whoever takes it on from you next can yeah. put another 200 aircraft in it. I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to be possible. Um, and, I, and I don't say that glibly, but it just... So let's... Let me formulate an answer to you here. Okay, so... It was a constellation of circumstances mm. that created this, right? So... I joined the museum 20 years ago as, as you know, um, sort of the senior curator, director of collections. And my role and responsibility is directly for the collection that's care, development, and all those things that are attendant with it. Um, we had gone through a bit of a challenging leadership turnover at the time. Uh, the board restructured itself. Uh, the executive leadership had turned over. So we were really in a, in a point in time where there was a willingness for the organization as a whole to look at how it was going to reinvent itself and head forward. I mean, you know, by 2001, 2002, um, you know, resources had become pretty tight, you know. Uh, you know, we certainly had visitors, but we didn't have a lot of extra money to, you know, um, to buy aircraft or even to transport them. I mean, these were still costly endeavors, right? Um, and it still is. Um, and... I came along and started to generate some 
contacts and opportunities. And I guess sort of the first real sort of big breakthrough I made was not long, but six, eight months after joining the museum, um, I just called up and introduced myself to Dave Talashe in California. And, um, you know, Dave, as many people know, is one of these legends of the Warbird movement and a bigger than life character and really responsible for a lot of things that people enjoy seeing in museums or at air shows. Um, you know, he's, yeah, look up Dave Talashe if you have some time. <laughs> but, and, you know, Charles Darby's uh, aircraft wrecks and where to find yep. them from the 1970s. Um, but anyway, you know, Dave was getting older at that point and um, he invited me out to California to you know, meet and talk turkey. And, um, you know, I didn't know it at the time. Dave was sort of one of these sort of, you know, heroes in your head that you grow up mm -hmm. knowing if you're following warbirds in aviation. And, you know, he was really terrific. And, you know, we hit it off. And, um, you know, I was later told by people that, well, you know, we got lucky because, you know, the, the best way to do business with Dave is with your hands in your pocket and your back to the wall, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we struck an arrangement where, you know, we would take on restoration loan, about a dozen of his airplanes that he had in storage in the Art of Chino or a couple other places and um, got to know his staff fairly well and developed a good rapport. And so I guess to sort of sidebar here a little bit and I'll, I'll, I'll hijack your interview, let's say, so how do you find the airplanes? Where are the airplanes at? What's what's the conduit? Well, so we get airplanes through a multitude of sources, right? Mm -hmm. So we we get a lot on loan from various federal agencies like the Air Force, the Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, um, NASA, things like that. Um, we also have a certain number that have been donated to us. Um, until comparatively recently, we didn't have the resources to buy things that we were interested in. Um, we've been fortunate to have some companies and other entities um, decide that there was some tax advantage to at least letting us preserve aircraft. So things were donated. Um, but one of our biggest sources of aircraft, and I would guess probably better than 125 aircraft in the collection, um, we've acquired through the General Services Administration Federal Surplus Donation Program. Um, and this is a program that's very, very unique to the United States. So what it means is an eligible or qualified nonprofit institution uh, with certain types of mission um, can qualify to receive federal surplus property through a state agency at a heavily discounted rate. So what does that mean? Well, that means through the surplus declaration process, you know, the, the Air Force or these the branches, they will put excess aircraft into this disposals pipeline. So... Um, at the first, at the highest level, the so so just to use for an example, let's say it's an F-16, right? So this F-16 gets declared excess. Nobody else in the Air Force wants it for operational reasons. <clears throat> it drops into the highest level. So any other federal agency that thinks it has a use for an F-16 can request that property and have it transferred to them. Yeah. Well, if that doesn't happen, it drops down to another level, um, another federal level, so say like the Forest Service or law enforcement agencies and things like that. And if nobody there decides they want an F-16, um, <clears throat> it drops down to the state level, which is where we come in. So once it's at the state level, I can look at a clearinghouse online. I mean, you used to have to go to the yard and look, but now it's all, it's all online. <clears throat> And you look at the property, and, and if it hasn't been requested or allocated, I, I call up my state area property rep and say, hey, there's an F-16 on, on GSA. We would like to put a freeze request on that. So what that means is if the state area property rep says, yeah, okay, I trust you guys, um, he'll put a freeze in it, goes in a shopping cart, it sits for a certain number of weeks, and then it clears out, paperwork's generated, it's, it's allocated to us, uh, we pay a small fee for acquisition, typically 1% of the acquisition value to a maximum of $1,500 to any one given airplane. Uh, paperwork's generated, um, the airplanes come to us, but there's also conditions in it too, right? So we have to use that property for its intended stated purpose for a minimum of five years after acquisition. So if, like, and this applies to, like, I, I can screen office equipment. Right. Mm -hmm. If I want filing cabinets, we can get them, but we have to use them for five years for its intended purpose. And we get audited, we get checked. It's it's not a Wild West type of program. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a it's a very well run, very well managed program. And there's a lot of excellent people in GSA who who make these opportunities possible for us. 
Um, after five years of some of these things, yeah, you know, if you're done with the filing cabinets or the golf cart's worn out, you know, you can you can shit can it. But most of the aircraft, you know, obviously we, we've taken them for long-term preservation yeah. storage. They become ours. But one of the other conditions, too, is they, they can't come out as basically commercially saleable aircraft, yeah. right? So data plates are taken away, records are retained. Okay, you've, you've benefited from this program that offers these things to be at a discount. And, you know, they're not dummies and they know there's, there's people that want to enterprise think, Oh, I can run a shadow black market, right? I'll, I'll screen this thing and then I can sell this Huey for $250,000 in five years. And, and, and they know what people want to do. So they make sure that that's, that's really not practical or possible, right? Um, depending what they are, sometimes they come demilitarized if they are on a commercially saleable list. So that means if they have a civil type certificate, you know, they, they tend to have less structural work done to, yeah. to make them unusable. So that's the single largest source of aircraft in our collection. After that would be the Air Force Museum, then the Navy Museum, then just, you know, random donations. And in the last 10 years, uh, we've benefited from the generosity and support of a patron who has a real love for airplanes and aviation history and kind of likes what we do out here. And he's happy to put his money behind, you know, projects and acquisitions so he'll come and we'll talk and you'll say well i think we need to find this go look um or what do you think we need or what opportunities are out there and let me know how much and we'll we'll talk about it and that's led to more and more people coming you know uh he's helped us build hangars and facilities i mean we've become you know not a you know sort of a dusty boneyard you know we've We've got a really nice restaurant. We've got a playground. We've got indoor facilities. We've got, you know, probably half the collection displayed inside and half the collection outside. So, you know, and 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 with that overarching foundational mission of if it flies, it fits, sort of, you know, an aerospace hard wrap cafe, you know, love all, take all. Um, you know, we've got something for everybody, right? You know, there's, you know, there's there's obviously the military purists and and the history of aerospace in the last hundred and twenty odd years. You know, the militaries of all nations have been the biggest technological drivers of, of innovation and production. So um, that is going to be a large segment of any aerospace museum's collection, but it's not our exclusive focus. Yeah, and, and the way the, the collection is displayed is not... I, I found it quite not traditional. because You're used to going into a hangar that is bombers, and it's bombers, for example, or yeah. fighters. <clears throat> you've got a lovely mix of... In the hangar one, you've got the some of the experimentals, some of the, the civil stuff, and then you've also got the Thunderbirds F4, you've got the Red Arrows Hawk. And mm -hmm. It's a way of seeing and understanding the differences of the aircraft, because it's quite interesting to see a pit special hanging above a Hawk. Yeah. We, me, associate both with aerobatics. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of yeah. see that link there. Yeah. What goes into, you know, going back into the day to your, yeah. your, your head of collections yeah. and, and Andrew's job today, what could seem, and I guess this is where the art of it comes in, what could mm -hmm. seem that you've just shoved a bunch of stuff yeah. in a hangar. Mm -hmm. How do you make the decisions to make it work so that actually it's quite co coherent in a way? Because if I'm being honest, mm -hmm. I did go around looking to ask some bitchy questions, but I couldn't really spot anything that was, yeah. you know, that's a bit silly. Granted, yeah. I think Andrew was well, preempted. Pre 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 yeah, yeah, you know, he I, was preempted yeah. me when I could get onto it. <laughs> But what, what goes into that? Because yeah. you have this availability that's come mm -hmm. in. The yeah. collection is what it is. It's not just a pile of stuff. Sure. How do you tell a story? Yeah. Well, so how do we determine what you know our layout is and our, our, our thought behind the display process? Well, initially, it was flat out pragmatic. I mean, there were things in the collection that were vulnerable to the environment. Fabric-covered airplanes. Uh, things that were relatively complete, um, have their interiors. I mean, a lot of times our aircrafts, you know, come out of military salvage processes and they're really just a big tube that looks mm. like an airplane, whereas others are flown in like Louise Timken's Learjet, right? With her zebra skin. That's, quite, that's quite something. That she hunted herself. Yeah. So a lot of it was really just, what was the most vulnerable? What was telling the story? Because there's always a mix to begin with. Over time, we've been... Thematic but loose, right? And if you're clever, you can you can string a narrative through all this stuff. Parenthetically here, so generally speaking, we collect display genuine aircraft, right? 
we don't really go much into replicas, but that's a whole other argument because you can make an argument that most flying Mustangs or Spitfires are replicas and <laughs> that's, not that's, original, right? So that's, well, that's we're, a show for another. Yeah, day. we're not yeah. going to touch third rail here, but there's always exceptions, and we've done that with you know our our Mustang is a composite aircraft of of a, an amalgamation of fifty percent original non-identity wow. parts with filled in the gap things that we wow. manufactured or purchased to assemble a Mustang for display. So, but in our, the, the first little 10,000 square foot footprint, if you step back and look at it and when, you're, when you're next in there, we have a representation wow. of every element of aerospace in the last hundred years with the exception of space. So you've got prototypes in the right flyer, right? We've got the smallest propeller-driven airplane, the Bumblebee. We've got the smallest twin-engine helicopter. We've got gyrocopters. home billets. We've got commercial. We've got civil. We've got military, sport aircraft. The whole hundred years is in a little digest, right? Coming out of that, we have an area where we do a lot of our contracted events, presentations, meetings, you know, kids' activities. You know, so we, we like to, to decorate that area with stuff that's sort of pop culture or eye-catching or popular so you have, you have the air display teams you've got our tomcat which was a background air crane in, in, in the first top gun movie at, at miramar we've got you know the huey gunship which is iconic from apocalypse now we've got these things that are just like they're great backdrops when somebody's having a dinner or a promotion ceremony or we're having our annual meeting or we're having our paper airplane contest it's just it just creates a really engaging atmosphere for people the other parts of the hangar eh, they wander around thematically but it, it follows roughly the same drift you know we've got seaplanes we've got experimental aircraft we've got reconnaissance aircraft and you know they all sort of overlap right so our main hangar complex is really sort of the most diverse representation. And this year we've been able to put more contemporary things inside on display versus, you know, most of the rest of the property, which is largely World War II era aircraft. Um, you know, we, we certainly can't underplay or underscore the importance of World War II for aviation, for history, for our collection, for the motivation of visitors. But it's starting to fade a little bit, you know, we're... We're getting into the twilight of the, of the World War II generation passing into memory, right? You know, I, I expect, you know, it maybe in the next five years we'll be having the ceremonies similar to 2001, 2002 when, you know, countries ceremoniously said goodbye to the World War I generation, yeah. right? So that's not the visitor drive that it was 20 or 25 years ago. Um, you're, we're finding a lot more people are coming in or <laughs> what I'll loosely call contemporary aircraft, but it's things that guys our age, late forties, early fifties, who've done a military career and retired and come through with their kids or God help us, their grandkids and say, Hey, that's an F-16 that I flew. And the F-16s are rocketing around ahead of us, right over top of us all the time. But they came into service in what, 1977? Right? I mean, they, they're, they're they not took, sprightly aircraft no, themselves no, anymore, no. no. I mean, no, to be fair, I mean, the, you know, the Block A's and B's were all retired in the early 90s, but uh, the F 16 is still recognizable as yeah. F 16, right? I mean, you know, <clears throat> you know, from a pop culture center, I mean, look, you know, the, the nickname of the Viper, you know, came from the pilots adopting the nickname from the 1978 sci fi series Battlestar Galactica. I mean, you know, Fighting Falcon didn't really roll off the tongue, right. so they co opted the informal nickname of Vipers, you know, sort of the same thing. Warthog's not an official name for the A 10, you know, it's a Thunderbolt 2, right? <laughs> Nobody except maybe the procurement office in the Pentagon calls it the Thunderbolt 2, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, so we, we've made efforts to put things grouped together. For presentation and, and interpretation, you know, recognizing that, you know, these things have become very, you know, valuable objects in and of themselves. They're important teaching tools. You know, we do have a mission to preserve the memories of, of the men and women who not only flew them or operated them, but the, the designers, the, the factory crews, the ferry crews, the test pilots. I mean, you know, everybody's seen those pictures where, you know, you have the, from World War II in particular, they did a lot of them were a little... The, this is what it takes to get a bomber over Berlin, right? So you've got the seven-man crew of the Halifax, and there's 45, you know, engineers, armorers, technicians, and then there's the weathermen and the, you know, the 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 wafts and all of this. There's, you know, there's like a hundred people behind the seven 
that are taking taking the fight. And that's true <coughs> of commercial aircraft, right? Oh, yeah. And for every two guys in the pilot and the six or seven cabin crew, there's a hundred guys on the ground provisioning the aircraft, fueling it, you know, making sure you're not going to miss your connection. <laughs> Sh shouting at them to get out on time so the thing yeah. actually moves. Yeah. Time's money, gentlemen, yeah. back from the gate. Yeah, you know. ten, 10 years yeah. of my life right yeah. there in that sense. Yeah. But, so, you know, we recognize the people that were on the home front, yeah. right? Look, to be fair, I mean, all of us doing this job here, and, and I, it's probably coming across here. Listen, you know, we're all big nerds about this. This is, this is a big passion, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to lead such a unique and important organization. But, you know, it's built on... The passion and dedication of a lot of people like me, the people that came before, you know, the staff, the volunteers, the politicians, donors, the funders who have all bought in and believed in what we're doing, right? And I think we see, I, I think you see a lot of that translated into the way we present exhibits and, and the sort of satisfaction that people take away. I mean, if you look at our, our Yelp or TripAdvisor type of things for whatever it's worth, you know, a consistent thread is like, I had no idea. It's huge. There was so much to see. It was so different. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've eavesdropped on plenty of people leaving the place. And, you know, you, you get a lot of women who've stopped and said, you know, I get taken to a lot of these places by my husband. And they're all kind of the same type of thing. And this is so different. It was so interesting. And, and you know, she's just I really kind of got drawn into it, right? So it's, you know, we're seeing a lot more multi-generational visits. Where, like, 20 years ago, it was a lot of the, the dedicated enthusiasts and a couple of drag-alongs. But, you know, we're seeing a lot more people where there's great-grandparents, their kids, their grandkids, their great-nieces, their, you know, uh, family groups with from toddlers up to, you know, octogenarians, yeah. right? And, you know, we strive to recognize people's service and sacrifice, whether it's military, commercial, um, you know, people that deliver the mail, fly cargo into remote territories. You know, they lose their lives routinely. You know, air, yeah. aircraft crash all the time with medical supplies on them. Uh, life flight helicopters go down. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a profession without peril. You know, we, we, it's got a tremendous safety record, but it's never not without risk. And a safety record that's been built on dedicated yeah. professionals and people committed on the ground at things like the FAA or the mm -hmm. CAA, um, the NTSB, uh, engineers at, at, at companies like Boeing or Lockheed or British Airways. They take the responsibility seriously. And, and, and we see that in how much we take aviation for granted yeah. as a culture. So... There's a lot to extract from it, you know, and it, um, it's a lot of fun. I, I, I won't lie, but I, I never get bored coming into work, right? <laughs> I, I, I get up and I look forward to it. It's not to say I don't have shitty days or, you know, times when I come home and bang my head against the wall. But, you know, overall, there's nowhere else I can really see myself now. I mean, you know, if I get frustrated, I can stand up from my desk, walk outside, and just sort of drink it all in, and I'm, I'm re-energized, just, you know talk to people who are here for the first time or maybe the only time who are just awestruck and, and don't have enough time and want to come back. So you talked about the connections that you've built up and those are not just limited to the US. So a lot of the institutions we have yeah. in the UK, the UK environment is an interesting one mm -hmm. um, in the, the, especially the rules around accredited museums and mm -hmm. things like that. But you have had quite a few interesting loans. You've just had the... Um, Kaisen, mm -hmm. come, is it Kaisen, the, the rocket, the, the Oka. Oka, that's yep. it, which is going on display tomorrow, and you were yeah. saying, yeah. now, how, how does that process work? Because one of the, the keys to sharing the love, I suppose, with these things, <laughs> is, to, is to get these loans to, to make, to make yep. these things, because Hendon, for example, Cosford, very limited on space, yep. so therefore, it coming here to be shown with two mm -hmm. other remarkable Japanese yeah. Yeah. suicide aircraft is going to be very interesting to see. So how, yeah. again, you come back to that relationship thing that helped, mm -hmm. helped those things, but how would a loan work? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we've, we've talked about how the government surplus system yeah. works here. Mm -hmm. How do you ring up yeah. someone else and go, I won't borrow any of your <laughs> toys? My liver has paid a high price for some of these <laughs> loans. Um, part of my job is to build relationships, establish bridges, support other museums as best we're able to, not always in the way they would like us to, but as best as we're able to. At the end of the day, in sort of all walks of life, as an individual or for an organization, is just the means to open a door, make an introduction. Right? But everything else 
is the relationship that you develop with people and people do things for people mm -hmm. um institutionally at a higher level sure you know there's a mission for i'll pick on the air force museum they've got a heritage mission they've got a program that 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 is that is available for eligible entities yeah. you know um if you develop a professional reputation with people and conduct yourself as a as a professional and you don't create problems for your colleagues um you respect the rules that they they put up with respect to aircraft you know so when they say you know don't decorate them with christmas lights you don't do that no matter how much pressure you get from your board or how fun it might be um you know, because they have conditions, right? And of course, you know, over time, there, there's just been professional conferences. You know, there's been things where I said, hey, I'm so-and-so from this place, and I'm going to be in town. I'd like to have a visit and introduce myself to the curator and say hi and look around. And, you know, some people are very receptive to that, and others are less so. Um, but by and large, I've found most of our colleagues nationally and internationally very similarly minded. We're all passionate about what we do. We're we're dedicated to it, and we you know we want the best for both our visitors and our collections. And you know, I don't lie, we derive a huge amount of personal satisfaction, you know, in doing what we do. So over years, you you build friendships, you know. And some of my ongoing, enduring, closest friendships that I have are, are people <laughs> in the profession, you know, even after they've retired, you know. So when you build the rapport and you build the trust and you build a professional reputation it becomes pragmatic and, and justifiable for somewhere like the RF museum to entrust us with a loan saying look you know we know these people we've worked with them you know they respect our rules and conditions and you know they also value the ability to represent their mission you know through exhibit over here right um you know, the alliances, the, the World War II alliances, the NATO mission, the, the mutual training, the weapon systems commonality, and it goes on. I mean, for years, you know, during the early part of the Iran-Iraq wars in the 2000s, it was pretty regular for me to see typhoons, tornadoes, and jaguars rocketing off the end of the runway over my office. You know, they were out here training on the ranges, doing combined services training, you know, being more heavily involved in places and things like Red Flag, right? Um, getting the opportunity to go out and very similar terrain to the Middle East to train on, you know, low-level operating tactics, terrain following. So, you know, it, it's an important part of what happens out here. It's part of our regional aviation history, so it's important. So, yeah, so we're, you know, we're, we're happy. You know, we provided artifacts to the RAF Museum on, on loan, for, for example. So it, it just makes good sense. You know, we, we all share and support. Our... And I guess it's a vital part of it because there's no one place is going to be able, even the amount of space you have, for example, you're yeah. not going to be able to have an example of, of everything. But there will no. be opportunities when for a year or two years yeah. you were able to display something you wouldn't normally be able to, to show. Oh, sure. The there's been certainly things I would have categorically dismissed 10 years ago we would ever had on display and i've eaten curl more than a few times <laughs> happily i might add because they're you know they're they're nice triumphs to have but you know it's interesting too you know like we we have a lot of visitors from from europe and south africa south america asia and you know they can come into a place like ours you know we've got a tornado and we've got a jaguar and we've got things that are common across the uk right mm -hmm. but when the visitor comes here from from the uk they were excited to see their history and their service represented in amongst a constellation of other great mythological things, right? So, you know, yeah, there's there's Spitfires all over the UK, but we get a lot of UK visitors who are excited to see an RAF museum loan Spitfire in and amongst our collection, mm -hmm. right? Or the French aircraft. You know, and more and more these days, we've been fortunate in being able to develop our, our airliner collection, right? Through, you know, our partnership and friendship with Boeing and, and some of the other airlines. You know, so you can see things here that you're not going to see elsewhere, you know, or, or in too many places. We have probably, outside of some dedicated helicopter museums, we probably have the strongest and largest vertical flight collection of anywhere in the world. Gotta love a whirly death machine. Well, you do, right? <laughs> it's interesting as well that I guess the, the, the reputation that you, you, you've built up over the years, the, the, the collection that's here has allowed things like the 
to fear telescope yeah. aircraft to come. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I guess it's those are the things that you're sort of keeping your ears the floor yeah. on. And you know, yeah. I guess it's it's looking for opportunity and ensuring that the relationships are in place mm -hmm. that should a door become yeah. a jar. You can mm -hmm. stick your foot in it. Yeah. Yeah, the camel's nose goes under the tent in quite a few places. Right? You know, this is this has been fascinating. We're going to spend more time with the collection over the next series of podcasts, and you very kindly sponsoring the podcast mm -hmm. for the next little while, which we're very happy for, which is the reason why we are here. The final question, really, I have is the bucket list question. Mm -hmm. For someone that has most of the toys, mm -hmm. what is the toy that you wish you could add to the Pima collection oh, in, in, wow. in your in your <clears throat> time here? You know, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, we drew up collections lists 10 years ago, 15 years ago with things that honestly I thought were unrealistic and unachievable. And you know, I have to say, I mean, you know, every year I say this, I, I think, you know, well, it's got to start slowing down at some point. And it hasn't yet, but I, I think we may be getting into a point where, you know, we may slow our collections growth simply because the opportunities for things that are unique and consequential we've either acquired them or they're not there right and so um you know we don't need to be out collecting paint schemes right you know the yeah. same airframe with a different service or a different era you know although we do have multiples i mean you know we have a lot of harriers but you know there's good reason because the harrier is a very unique aircraft over the course of its life and every version of it is very different from the previous like they're just not paint scheme changes they are they are consequential engineering and operational capability transformations right yeah. so and, and they were available and we have the resources so we sprung on it right i don't know i mean look we're on we're on the loan request list for certain things from from the government partners and some of those things we're just gonna have to wait until they're available at whatever point in their operational life cycle right you know we will eventually see a b1 bomber here i don't know when that's going to be i suspect probably when the whole type retires the ones that are out there on display now are largely you know very very early version a models that were left in place as gate guards when, when bases closed right um you know it's still a high value airframe and parts on it are very valuable doors and landing gear and control mm. surfaces in particular so you know until there's no longer a viable means to keep the b1 in service i don't think we'll see one you know a c5 galaxy has been a popular one that people have clamored for i mean they're they're all across the street but again you know they're they're supplying part for you know a vital airlift capability um you know, we have most everything the U.S. Navy operates of any consequence contemporaneously. I mean, probably, a, you know, an E-2 and, a, uh, you know, a Growler, you know, or a Superbug would be probably the big things. But again, that's just going to be waiting. Modern aircraft stay in service for a very, very long time. You know, I mean, the A-10 is probably in the twilight of its service, but, you know, it, they've been it, saying that for the last decade. Uh, well, they've been saying that since 1988. But <laughs> but it really is going to wear out at some point. And there's not going to be spares. And there's not going to be mission to support it. But at this point, you know, it's been in Tucson as long as we have. You know, the A-10s went operational in 1977. Um, we're, we're kind of closing the books on World War II, you know, because it's, it's slipping into history. And we have been able to really diversify and broadly represent you know the allied and, and adversarial nations from that conflict with the japanese collection some of the russian stuff the the german things we have mm -hmm. in restoration you know we've we've got very consequential airliner you know an airbus of some birth not one of the biggest ones i mean i i would probably decline the opportunity for an a380 because i don't see how we <laughs> could manage a million pound airplane yeah um you know, about a 319 or a 321 would be perfect right i can't say never because opportunities fall out of the blue and I what do you think we should have, Matt? Well, I, 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 I asked when we drove past the B1s. <laughs> I haven't been around everywhere yet. Mm -hmm. And I still have you know, a, a, yeah. few, a few days of, of, of doing that. But it's yeah. what is fascinating is just the breadth of it. And to be able to walk, which I'm looking forward to doing in the next couple of days, is walk down the, the flight line of, of the jet bombers as well. With yeah. you know, the B36, B47, the B52s and, on, and onwards. Because that's is going to be something but, but then turn around and see the the orvis eye hospital see sophia being ready for for display as well yeah 
I'm someone who tends to lean towards the military stuff, mm-hmm. but having spent a, a career in civil aviation, I get that draw as we we're talking about at lunch. That, that's a personal connection for me to go over to see the 733-300, which was what my airline operated back in the day. It's, it's to go see Sophia, which is about as unique an aircraft as you can. Sure. And it's probably going to be only a 747 SP preserved anyway. Yeah. And especially now that the, 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 there are no more 747s to Do be made. Know? And no. the ones that are still flying aren't going to be around for... Yeah, they got probably 20 years yeah. of viable commercial life. It's so I, I don't I don't know. Obviously, a B1 would be, yeah. be lovely. Yeah. Uh, just to complete the sure. big bomber collection. Well, what's happening too with aerospace across the board is it's becoming much more of an inverted pyramid, right? I mean, you don't have the diversity of design that you did a generation ago, right? Um, engineering, modeling, fuel efficiencies. The, the advances in aerospace you're seeing aren't always visible advances. They're materials advances. It's, it's the switch to composites. It's the... You know the potential for multi-fuel engines or electrically powered aircraft um it's not going to be you know kind of like you've seen with cars you know every mid-sized sport utility vehicle looks is faintly like, indistinguishable from every other one right looks like a mid-sized sports <laughs> utility <laughs> right there's this little you know bulgy egg-shaped thing with you know the the same aerodynamics the same mirror configuration the, you know you might see some difference in the shapes of the headlight but you know 90 percent of these things are really indistinguishable whether you know and and aviation is has gone the same direction you know a real diversification in, in, in civil aircraft. I mean, there's so many civil aircraft available on the race seal market, it's really hard for someone to put a toehold into a high-speed composite performance support aircraft and find a market that's going to keep them in the business, right? Um, you know, how do you launch an airplane like that when there's... 27,000 Cessna 172s potential. Aviation, to a certain extent, while it's become utilitarian force in our lives and is very important for our commerce and our our, our transportation, sadly, some of the mystique of it, like the magic's gone from it, right? The unfortunate requirements for security around airports and airfields, the cost of operating, fuels, uh, insurance. uh, You know, when I was, I could go and watch airliners at the end of the runway. Now you do that, you're going to get chased away by the police. Um, you know, airfields were kind of open spaces where you know, they were affordable. People, you know, your average car salesman could have an airplane, right? Um, now it's become very much an elite pursuit, unless you've gone something as like like ultralights, where you know you're flying a a parachuted backpack. But even you know, like the civil airfields aren't welcoming to a twelve year old boy to come out. Like you know, like, I used to be able to go out and people say, hey, hop in, but you know, don't touch this. I'm not saying that people, like the owners of these airplanes aren't sympathetic to that, but the airport environments they're in don't permit people to wander and, and invade the perimeter out of curiosity. So what you don't get is a lot of younger kids getting that same spark in the same way that you and I probably. I, I totally agree. I think there's a, it's an interesting cult, cultural shift. What we've seen is the results of the, the last 20 years yeah. of the world sure. environment. But also, we also have this fascinating point as well, where aircraft themselves are going to need to change to stay viable yeah. the, in, in, in their own right, which yeah. is, you know, with Joe and the work that he, he's doing yeah. with electric aircraft. Yeah. That's going to be equally fascinating. But again, I think that's where the work that you guys do mm-hmm. in the museum sector, yeah. because we can't go plain spot like we used to, yeah. or no. you know, just want, wander down to the local aerodrome and, and yeah, and do some mystique of like, look, you know, in the 70s and into the 80s, I mean, you know, people used to dress up to go on airplanes. I mean, in Canada, you know, Ward Air used to cook steaks and things mm. on the flights to Hawaii. You know, now you go on an airplane, you're just as likely to get into a fist fight with somebody over them reclining their table, their their seat, right? And I don't mean this to disparage anybody, but it's become more. They become more like flying Greyhound buses. It, 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 it's a means to an end. It's not. It's not an exciting thing. It's become a service that lacks. Service. Yes. Yeah. And. And it's yeah, you know, just just in my short time in, in the game to to see the the gradual reduction of it to a race race to the bottom. Yeah, it's a shame because when we you know sit down and geek out about I hate to say old days because mm-hmm. it's not that long ago when it was so very different. And I kind of hope it there there'll be a, a shift going forward again that 
At he's, some point, this will be he, the old days for somebody. Yeah, because people can't put up with this for much. Like, please, people, don't put up with it. But yeah, you know, I think that's that's where it's interesting crossroads where it's going to be exciting to see how this is then contextualized yeah. in in the future. And I mean, more so, the destination has been more become more exciting than the journey. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of people who are very passionate about it, but it's becoming much more of a niche industry, right? Mm. You know, there are a lot of great opportunities in aviation, but they're just really not in the cockpit, you know, yeah. they're, they're in the background, they're in the maintenance facilities, they're in the avionics, they're in the structures, it's in, you know, manufacturing, it's in design. Um, it's shifting and evolving, right? It's the beauty of, of humanity, right? You know, we were never standing still with stuff and, um, you know, sort of circle the square. I mean, I think some of the discontent, you know, you find in museum patrons and the enthusiasts you know you, you talked about that on one of your recent podcasts about sort of you know the backlash towards people that's entirely unwarranted for people who are doing their jobs in the best way they can within the framework that they've been mandated it can't stay the same yes right? they're going to change they they have to appeal to certain audience and you know and i understand people's sentimentality you know, most people's lifelong interests and passions are formulated unconsciously when they're a kid, right? Mm -hmm. It's a positive experience. It's a chance. It's a chance, your grandfather. It's a chance. It's a chance, chance encounter. Right. It's going for a flight at an airplane. Somebody who was friendly and you know and introduced you to fixing a car or a visit to an art museum, and that's what 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 gets into your head. And you know, you know, so it's important for us to be able to provide that experience for younger people to come in and have those those wild wow moments and mm -hmm. maybe set them on a career path that you know. They could never have imagined. Um, and you, you made that point. It, it's not that I want to fly that. It's I want to know how that works. Yeah. Which is a parallel, but very different path as well. Right. Which, that's a positive point. Yeah. Let's leave it on that. <laughs> Good idea. And we finished our cocktails. Yep. I think it's probably a natural. Yes. We, we, we've paced ourselves well through that. Yeah. Thank yep. you so much. Well, thank you, Matt. Getting these insights on how a museum works is a theme that I'm passionate about and that we're going to continue here on the podcast. I cannot thank Scott enough for his time and generosity over the course of my visit. The work Scott and his team do at Pima is remarkable. In the days I was there, I was almost overwhelmed by the breadth and depth of the collection. Being able to delve into what makes the place tick was invaluable too, and I hope you found it interesting to see how a large collection is managed. Through Pima, I've had the chance to meet some incredible people and you're going to hear from them over the coming months. So be sure to subscribe to the feed and follow us on all the social medias where we'll be teasing those people out. All of those are available in the descriptions below as always. But remember, the best way to help the podcast get out there is just tell your friends. Let them know how it's going on and giving us a few stars and a little review in the podcast app of your choice. It's going to be a great ride. We're going to be talking everything from moving large aircraft to the local aviation scene in Arizona to things like Huey gunships, F-117 stealth fighters, and B-17s over Germany. It was a lot of fun, and I cannot wait to share everything that happened last week with you. If you'd like to know more about the Pima Air and Space Museum, the Titan Missile Museum, and the Arizona Aviation Hall of Fame, check out all the links in our description below where you'll be able to go to their websites and see what they have in their collections, what they're about, and just who is in the Arizona Aviation Hall of Fame. Until next time, thank you so much for your support. And as always, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone, and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.